Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, and that means, of course, it is time for our midweek Bible study. We are continuing our current uh, topic, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. Some of you folks who have been with us for a number of years may remember that we did about a 23-week uh, study several years back that we titled Paranormal 101 that is still available for viewing on our Dallas Church channel, which we still maintain. Um, that study series garnered tens of thousands of views over the course of years. And so we um, certainly don't want to uh, take that offline. Many people still watch it, and we hope benefit from it. But we thought being here in Alabama now that it would be a good idea to do um, a similar study once again, and that way we can have it on our Alabama Church channel. And of course, um, every time we teach on something, um, I kind of come at things a little different. Uh, I do not ever take old notes and use them for a new study. I literally research all over again. I literally will go in and start from scratch and draw an outline and create notes uh, each and every time I teach on any given subject, regardless of what uh, subject it may be, whether it's a book of the Bible, whatever the case may be. And I do that because oftentimes um, looking at things anew, you get fresh insight and you get, you know, um, new thoughts as to, you know, I should talk about this or I should mention this. Because maybe in the previous study, uh, you breezed through something and you, you didn't uh, include in your notes, you know, certain things. So you wound up not including that in the study. So... I think those of you who are familiar with our old study, like Amy, who I see is watching, hi Amy, um, you'll uh, probably, you know, I, I think you can recognize that uh, the way we're approaching it this time is quite a bit different than the way we did last time. And of course, part of what makes it different is the fact that last time uh, our church in Dallas, we did have a little building. We did have uh, a congregation, not a huge congregation, but a congregation nonetheless. So as I was teaching, we had people in the room. Uh, this study is a little different because uh, at the moment we don't have an audience uh, be in prayer. I have some exciting news. Tomorrow evening, uh, I've invited some younger people who I came into contact with through Facebook. And uh, they expressed an interest in the church. And uh, they not only expressed an interest in the church, but they expressed a real interest in helping us to do a number of things that we desperately need help doing. One of the individuals is a uh, pianist and plays a number of other instruments as well, guitar, violin, different things. And he has expressed a willingness to help us with music, which I'm really excited about. We haven't had live musical accompaniment in years, and I really, really prefer that. Um, so we have, uh, I'm going to be meeting with him, Tommy and I, tomorrow evening, as well as uh, one of his friends and roommates that also is interested in coming and helping us. And this friend has expressed an interest in helping us with our video production. That would be fantastic because... That would allow Tommy to get out of behind the computer for the first time in years 
and actually be able to simply be in the service, which would be fantastic. So keep us in prayer because uh, from what these folks are telling me, they've got about four people, including themselves, who are interested in helping us uh, to do some of the things I've shared with them that our ministry is interested in doing, including things like karaoke nights and uh, bingo and different things to create some uh, opportunities. The community here is so fragmented and there are no establishments where folks in this area can go and be themselves and be comfortable and be accepted. And so I feel like this is an opportunity for the church to do some outreach, you know, to create uh, events that are non-religious in nature, but will allow the community to come together and um, hopefully find some unity, find some common ground. And then, of course, <clears throat> learn about our church and hopefully uh, want to eventually come and be part of the church as well. So keep that in prayer. We'll be meeting with these folks tomorrow evening. Uh, so I'm excited about that. I want to move right into our Bible study tonight. So before we begin, we like always to begin with a word of prayer. If you'll bow your heads with me, Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for every opportunity that we have to open the sacred text and to learn from your word. But, Master, we cannot learn anything of value. We cannot take anything from the Word of God that is able to help us to bring salvation, to bring healing, to bring deliverance and freedom, except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. For the anointing makes the Word of God come alive in our hearing and in our spirit. It helps to confirm that that which we are hearing is in fact the Word of God and not merely the opinions and ideas of men. And Master, the anointing takes that Word and plants it deep in the rich soil of our heart so that it might spring forth and bring life, liberty, growth, faith into our spirit. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch your servant tonight. Help me, Lord, to effectively communicate those things which you would have me to communicate at this hour. And touch every hearer, every viewer, those watching live, those who will watch later. And let them receive tonight, O oh God, the engrafted word of God. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Okay, last week uh, we ended our session as uh, we were just getting into the subject of demonic activity and the types of demonic activity. By way of a quick um, overlap, I'll remind you that demonic activity begins generally uh, at vexation. Vexation is an external action. That means the spirit is not taking up residence inside anyone. It is operating from outside. But vexation is unique because uh, vexation is kind of a, uh, the way I, I presented it last week, you know, when you go and visit someone in their home, and they have a really friendly dog that just loves to jump on people and get up on your lap and lick on you, you know. And uh, you're in their home, and their dog just feels perfectly comfortable leaping all over you, jumping on you, licking you. Well, with vexation, it is generally born of being in the company of someone who has a spiritual attachment. Now, spiritual attachment 
we refer to from a biblical perspective as oppression. Uh, oppression is a step up from vexation. It is still external, but at that point, enough of a door, as it were, has been opened uh, by an individual to make a marriage between them and this spirit possible. Okay, uh, they have left the door ajar. They've left it open just a bit. Usually, without fail, it will be uh, unintentional. They did not mean to do this, but they open a door a little bit. The demon sees that as an invitation. Uh, with uh, oppression, it is not an invitation to take up residence within the person, but it is a, an, an invitation, just like when a believer believes the gospel initially, um, they become led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will lead you and guide you into all truth. That doesn't mean you've received the Holy Ghost yet. Doesn't mean you've received the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But God certainly becomes an active part of your life because the Spirit of the Lord begins to lead you. The Spirit of the Lord begins to groom you and teach you and nurture you uh, so that you can grow in the knowledge, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything demons do, in effect, there is a a similar operation on the godly side of the equation. Everything works very much the same way. Um, and, and we're going to be getting into this in much more detail uh, not too long from now, okay? But vexation, one of the things about vexation, if you have ever known a person who has certain traits, certain qualities in their life that are so toxic that when you get around them, you feel horrendous, you feel terrible, you feel miserable, uh, and you almost can't wait to get away from them because they are so negative, they are so critical, they are so judgmental, they are so nasty, they are so rude. Um, they cuss so much, they're so angry, they're so depressed, uh, they're so implacable. All of these sort of traits can be the evidence of spiritual uh, oppression. That person may have an actual spirit that is attached to them. And the reason they become so engrossed in certain very negative, self-destructive, um, alienating uh, personality traits. Uh, one of the first operations demons love to engage in is uh, they go out of their way to try to separate you from the crowd. Therefore, if a demon can introduce something into your life that causes people to pull away from you and to draw away from you, they're going to do that. That'll be one of the first things. You remember I talked about the fact that demons work um, in order of succession. You know, the weaker, the lower um, authority spirits are the first to enter into a person's life. And again, I don't mean into their body, I mean into their life. That is oppression. The, the weaker, the lower level spirits are going to uh, begin to oppress. They're going to begin to attach themselves and work from the outside. And they're going to do everything in their power. They're going to whisper in that person's ear, so to speak. They're going to torment that person's mind. They're going to do everything they can to encourage that person to engage in activities, personality traits, emotions that are going to drive people away. Uh, I have members of my own family that I know, I know, 
are oppressed of demons. Um, but if you try to tell them that, if you try, to, they're they're going to argue and fight with you till the cows come home. Uh, you cannot, folks. You cannot yank a demon off of somebody if that person has entered into a relationship with that spirit and they are in effect holding hands with it, okay? Uh, spirits can only be dislodged once an individual has finally decided to release it and let it go. And uh, this is one reason why those of you who have followed our ministry for any length of time, I talk about the fact that it's imperative that we follow God's leading when it comes to dealing with people who may be oppressed or possessed by a demonic spirit, because uh, oftentimes in hearing the Word of God, in, in experiencing the anointing of the Holy Ghost, people will begin to recognize that there's something going on, and they will begin to release, and they'll begin to let go of these things that they've been harboring and that they've been coddling and babying many times for years and decades, and then the Lord may speak to you, okay, now, now cast that demon out, now rebuke that spirit. Because at that point, that person has let go. They've released it enough so, the, so that now you can successfully remove it. If you start running around trying to rebuke demons in people uh, at will, and you think you're doing any good, you're not. If that person is content to live with that spirit and to host that spirit and to work in cooperation with that spirit, you're not going to be able to move it. That's one of the rules of the game. And that's what we're talking about now, the rules of the spirit realm. So one of the rules is as long as a person is willing and desirous of having that spirit in their life, you're not going to be able to dislodge it. In order to dislodge it, they have to do the opposite of what was necessary to bring it into their life. They have uh, to bring it into your life. You have to have an open door. You have to have somehow, some way, given that spirit permission, okay, to access your emotions to access your character, to access your thinking, to access your life. And um, so therefore, to get rid of it, you in effect have to revoke that permission or shut that door, okay? And uh, But people who are walking, for instance, people who are miserable, negative uh, constantly angry and full of angst and bitterness, but they're perfectly happy to live like that. Now, we may, from an external standpoint, we may look at that person and think, who on earth would want to live like that? My father is like that. My father uh, has got more demons than probably anybody I know on this planet. And you want to talk about vexed Try growing up a child in the home of an individual who has demons, literally, like this, um, and is happy to have them and coddles them and is in perfect, um, you know, and in, in, is perfectly uh, happy to be working with these things and offering them cooperation. Um, Children who grow up in that kind of an environment grow up vexed. They become vexed by any number of spirits, okay? And those spirits will make the child, they'll make the spouse, they'll make people, uh, siblings and parents and anybody around them, they'll make you about lose your mind. They will literally make you just about crazy, okay? Uh, vexation is uh, 
like that dog, the only difference is the dog isn't just jumping up on your lap and licking you. The dog is chewing on your fingers. The dog is biting you. The dog is chewing your clothes off of your body. It is doing any number of destructive things. And, uh, and this is why, of course, so many people with someone like this opt to pull away from them and try to stay away from them. One of the other manifestations of spiritual vexation is when you get around someone who has, for instance, a judgmental spirit or a critical spirit. They love to just sit and sit talking about people judging one person after another, being critical of everybody they talk about. And, uh, and you find yourself, when you're in that person's company, falling into the same behavior. And yet, when you're at home, you don't act like that. When you're by yourself, you don't act like that. Um, Spirits that vex in this way are often most effective when it comes to like familiar relationships, family relationships, when it's your mother, your grandmother, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your siblings, your children. Um, you get around them and all of a sudden you find yourself falling into you know, uh, someone can have a spirit of addiction even, and you get around them, and whereas normally if you drink at all, you drink in moderation. And then all of a sudden, though, you get around them and you find yourself behaving as they do, okay? This is why the Word of God teaches us that corrupt communications uh, I mean, excuse me, evil communications or associations uh, corrupt good manners. You've got to be careful about who you hang around with. You've got to be careful about who you enter into fellowship with. You've got to be careful about um, being close to people who have spiritual attachments and who are perfectly content to have those attachments. Um, getting in their company, being in their company very often, and you're going to literally find yourself slowly drifting in that direction. And you'll literally see those spirits are literally going to be able to gain greater and greater access to you through them. That is vexation. Now, oppression is when the spirit has the opportunity, when opportunity has been made available to a spirit to uh, attach itself, okay? And that means that, um, let me see, I, I'm going to try to, it's kind of like dating. I, I'm going to use this analogy. It's kind of like dating. You go out with somebody, if you like them, you might see them again. Uh, if you really like them, you might see them again. But if you really, really like them, then you find yourself uh, kind of steadily going out with them or going steady, as it were. Now, you're not married, you're not engaged, but you have attached yourself to that person, and that person has attached themselves to you. Uh, there is an expectation, as it were, that you would be together because uh, you've kind of paired up and become a couple without any formal relationship bond. You know, you're not engaged, you're not married, there, you know, there's no formal um formalization of your relationship, but yet at the same time, you're very much a couple, okay? The same thing happens in the spirit realm. When a spirit sees an opportunity, now let me tell you how opportunities arise, and, and we are going to be going in the next few weeks, we're going to be going through a number of things, um, 
where opportunity is given to spirits, okay? And I'm going to be breaking all of them down for you. But spirits operate in the realms of human emotion. They operate in the realms of character, okay? And they operate in the realms of our weaknesses. So what happens is, <clears throat> if... If we do not strive to walk in a biblical Christian manner, if we do not strive to respond to circumstances and situations which occur in our life in a biblical manner, then the enemy sees an opportunity. Okay, there's a chink in your armor. Now, let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, and it can be much simpler than this. It can be much more complex than this. I know a young lady. I grew up with her in church. I love her dearly. Um, she was always a really sweet kid, a very uh, just real sweet, precious young lady. And um, she had a younger sister, and her younger sister wound up being killed in a car accident. This, uh, this young woman is a Christian, mind you, and she became so upset. And she allowed herself, listen to how I'm wording this, she allowed herself to become angry at God for the death of her sister. Now listen, an experience like that can be tough. There is no doubt, there is no question. But we are called to be followers of Christ, we are, be, we are called to follow his example. We are called to trust in the word of God and to lean on the spirit of God as part of our Christian walk. She became angry at God and she began to express that anger toward God more and more and more. Well, I'm going to tell you, a spirit of anger saw the opportunity and said, Aha, this girl's mad at God for this. And let me just get close enough to her and see if she'd be interested in going steady, so to speak. She seems to be pretty comfortable being angry at God. She seems to be pretty comfortable in this, and I believe with all my heart that she wound up developing a relationship with a spirit of anger. Now, I told you before, spirits work. Uh, once one gets on the scene, his job is to push the door open a little wider so that a more powerful, uh, a higher level a spirit with more authority and power can come in. Uh, they literally have to come in in succession. So the first one's always going to be, in essence, the weakest one. But then they're going to grow in power. They're going to grow in authority as they continue to add up. That door began to be pushed open, and next thing you know, a spirit of bitterness came in. A spirit of bitterness, my friend. The Word of God said, lest the spirit of bitterness spring up and trouble you. A spirit of bitterness is like a bad tooth. It has deep roots and is very difficult to remove. Causes a lot of pain, a lot of angst. Then that spirit of bitterness winds up giving way to a much more powerful, much more influential spirit of unbelief. Now we started out mad at God. 
we became bitter. Now we're not sure we even believe in God anymore. And the demons are laughing all the way to hell and back because they are pulling you away from your faith. They are pulling you away away from what keeps you well spiritually and mentally and psychologically. Long story short, during the COVID uh, shutdown, um, this young woman was pretty much stuck at home with her kids uh, all the time. She had three children, two boys and a girl who was the oldest, a teenager. And uh, Without going into great detail, one day, while her husband and her oldest son were out of the house, um, she snapped. And before you know it, she had grabbed a gun and had shot dead her daughter, her oldest daughter, um, who was giving her a little lip and, you know, going through that stage as a teenager where she was being somewhat rebellious and, you know, troublesome. And she shot and killed this girl. Then she turned the gun on her youngest child and shot him. And he, he was paralyzed because he got shot through the spine. And um, before the daughter was shot and killed. She had called her dad on the phone and told her dad what was happening and mom's going to kill me. And her, the mother was just screaming and losing her mind. And uh, he, he rushed back home with his other son and they found his wife there uh, having shot the youngest, having killed the daughter. Uh, long story short, I immediately knew, I knew immediately, uh, knowing the situation and understanding what had transpired with the daughter and, uh, excuse me, with her sister passing away and her reaction to that. And I said to my mother, I said, uh, this was spiritual. This was spiritual in nature. Um, this was egged on and caused by a demonic oppression. And um, my mother happened to talk to uh, an aunt of mine, uh, and the aunt is related to this girl through marriage and everything. And so, uh, and my aunt said, Donna, that sounds exactly right. She said, that makes so much sense. Uh, it's not even funny because she did. She was a good Christian. She loved the Lord. She was faithful. Then her sister got killed in this car wreck. And all of a sudden, she was mad at God. And before too long, she was bitter and angry all the time. And the next thing you know, her faith had pretty much gone out the window. And then this happened. Folks, this is why it is so imperative uh, that we not be careless in how we react and how we respond to circumstances which occur in our life. Many years ago, back in 89, as a matter of fact, um, I went through an experience. Many of you know my story. I don't have the time to share it today. But I went through an experience that um, basically caused me to make the decision to come out and just live my life honestly. And I said, oh, well, if I go to hell, I'm going to go to hell because I can't do this anymore. I was trying everything in my power to live what the church said I was supposed to live. I hadn't done anything with anybody. But... Uh, the suspicion was there, and all of a sudden, I was outed, in effect, in, in a church, and I was treated like yesterday's trash. I mean, honey, I, they beat me up every which way but upside down. And I finally just decided, Lord, I've been trying my whole life to do the right thing, and all they needed was to suspect I was gay, and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and blah, blah, blah. So, um, 
I moved back to my home state of Connecticut from Texas where this transpired. <clears throat> and um, I had been pastoring a church in East Texas. Um, I had given up the pastorate, put all of my possessions in storage in the building we were using for the church. A, a woman from our church was continuing the work. And uh, so it, it, the church did not close. She was continuing the work. Uh, I was going to another city. I was going to sit in a man's church and learn from him for a while. He was a very, very successful uh, man of God, and I felt like I maybe could learn something from him observing his ministry. I wanted to be effective in winning souls and bringing people into the kingdom of God. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take a little while to learn from this man. And this is the church in which all of this mayhem occurred. And uh, so when all this transpired, word gets out in Pentecostal and apostolic church circles like you want to believe. Let somebody screw up. And honey, they're on the telephone calling everybody, and especially if it's a preacher. And so I was terrified to even go back to try to retrieve my possessions because uh, I just knew, you know, everybody in the world knew what had happened and, and you know, I was going to be ridiculed and go through just some horrific things and I wasn't looking forward to doing that. And it took me a few months before I finally made a phone call to one of the ladies in the church um, and I told her, I said, I'm getting ready to come down and pick up my things and um, get them, you know. And she said, oh, pastor, there must have been a terrible mistake. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, Sister Johnson had a big rummage sale and sold every single thing you owned. She said, she said that uh, you had authorized this. I never authorized any such thing. But... I had things that my mother had given me from the, the house I grew up in. I had family heirlooms. I had a lifetime of possessions. I had a pastoral library that consisted of all kinds of books and uh, study materials and research books, uh, Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias, commentaries, you name it, I, uh, Bible atlases. This is, of course, before the internet. And, I mean, I had all these things, and this lady sold every single thing I owned. And somebody said to me, well, you need to sue her, boy. You need to take her to court. Now, mind you, I was out of church. I thought God hated me. God didn't want me anymore. The church certainly didn't want me anymore. I was out of church, but I still knew how to act like a Christian. And I said, I can't do that. And they said, well, why? You know, I think it was an uncle or somebody said to me. And I said, because the word of God teaches that we're not to take a brother or a sister to law. We're not supposed to take um, members of our Christian family to court. I said, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay so therefore, I just have to leave this in God's hands and let the Lord handle it. I have to let the Lord deal with it. And now some of you might say, well, boy, that must have been um, difficult. It was. <laughs> it was. But what wasn't difficult is knowing what the right thing for me to do was. I knew what the right thing for me to do was. Immediately. I didn't have to think about it. I know what the Word of God teaches. I didn't have to think about how to respond to this situation. I knew. Instinctively, I knew. Implementing that, 
was difficult only to the extent that you would get frustrated sometimes and, and angry and, Lord, you know, I've lost everything, everything. Honey, I literally had a suitcase of clothes, a Bible, and a concordance, a Bible concordance that I had won as a teenager in my church as a kid. That is all the possessions I had in 89 when I came out. That's all I was left with. Everything else this lady sold, and if she didn't sell it, she'd give it away to uh, Goodwill or Salvation Army or whatever. Now, what kind of spiritual trouble did I spare myself by responding to this the way that I did? Oh, a whole, whole lot. If I had decided to become angry, if I had decided that I was within my rights, bless God, to just be mad as murder and bless the Lord, you know, then I may have gone through a similar succession as this young lady that I spoke about a few moments ago. I, I may have wound up uh, making way for a spirit of anger to attach itself to me, which in turn would have pushed the door open for a spirit of bitterness, which in turn can open the door to uh, uh, many things. That uh, A lot of people, it's, it's not necessarily anger, bitterness, uh, unbelief, but it may be anger, bitterness, murder anger, bitterness, revenge. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, but it's that succession. It's climbing the stairs to more and more powerful spirits. And at the top of the list, now that young lady I mentioned, we had anger, bitterness, unbelief, murder. Okay. Um, but I may have, if I had given myself the opportunity, uh, for a spirit to attach itself in this circumstance, I may have wound up going anger, bitterness, and then maybe revenge, and then I would have been trying to figure out some way to get back at this woman who had done this to me, okay? And what's dangerous is, as a spirit oppresses from the external, you can go from simply going steady to marrying, joining yourself to that spirit in a very literal spiritual way. And that spirit at that point does in fact take up residence in your body. It literally takes up residence. All spirits, the only spirit that has a right to live within you is the Spirit of God, okay? All spirits are intruders. They are um, trespassing. They have no business in your body. Uh, they have no business in your life for that matter. But when we give a spirit that is oppressing us when we give them enough opportunity, when we allow the door to open enough, they then can say, well, honey, there ain't no sense of me living out here trying to influence you. I can move in, and at this point, you virtually have given me the controls. And once that spirit moves in, they're literally able to drive you like a tank. You know, they're able, they're able to just drive you and exercise control over you. And uh, now you're dealing with a very dangerous situation. The term for, um, or excuse me, the biblical word for vexed, is pasco, which is a verb meaning to be affected or having been affected to feel or to have a sensation experience. Um, the term for uh, oppressed in the Greek, also a verb, is katanuska, kat, katadunastayo. It's, it's a long word in the Greek, meaning to exercise 
harsh control over one or to use one's power, one's own power against one. Possession in the Word of God, there's actually no Greek word that is translated possession. What happens in the, uh, the Greek lexicon, if you read the New Testament in Greek, what you'll find is the term that is used, devil, D-E-V-I-L, is actually a verb, and it is a verb. Dahimonai, I can't even pronounce it. D a i m o n i z o m a i. Okay, that's the Greek word, and that word literally means to be under the power of a demon. Okay, there are innumerable instances in Scripture where people are referred to as being possessed uh, by demons. Matthew 8, 16, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Matthew 8, 28, And when he was come to the other side into the country, of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Matthew 8, 33, And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils, Matthew 9, 32, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil, meaning a man who could not speak. Matthew 12, 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Uh, we're going to go into this more in the future. We're going to go into more detail. However, there are what are referred to as spirits um, of infirmity. What that means is a spirit that is the cause of what appears to be a physical ailment. I've cast demons out of people. And uh, one lady in particular, I, I remember casting demons out of her in a United Pentecostal church many years ago. And she told me how that for like three years, she had really been suffering with extremely painful um, uh, sensation in her female parts. And she said, I keep going to the doctor, and the doctor tells me there's nothing there. Well, a spirit of infirmity can operate in two different ways. They can either be the cause of what otherwise appears to be a sickness or disease, and when you cast the demon out, the cause is gone, so boom, uh, it disappears. There's no more disease. There's no more sickness. In this case, the Word of God says that there came to him one who was uh, possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, meaning he was blind and unable at the same time to speak. And it says, and he, Jesus, healed him. So this instance, the blindness and his inability to speak were caused by a demon. So when the Lord... Uh, rebuke the demon, this man suddenly can see and he can speak. Okay, so there, there was a spirit of infirmity here that was the cause of this man's um, physical issues. But a spirit of infirmity can also torment people in another way. And that is, they can camouflage real physical conditions so that doctors don't see it. People think demons don't have a powerful um, 
influence on the natural world. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. When I cast demons out of this woman, I told her, I said, now go back to your doctor. She'll be able to see what the problem is now. She went back to her doctor and she came back to me and she said, my doctor was utterly dumbfounded. She said, I have a cervical infection that is so bad. My doctor said, how in the universe can I not have seen this over the last three years? You've been complaining about this for three years. She said, how on earth could I not have seen this? She said, this is so bad that it obviously has had to be uh, present for years. Okay, so a spirit of infirmity can work uh, from either direction. They can either be the cause of a uh, an illness that physically is not there, and yet it appears to be there. Yet when you cast out the devil, boom, the infirmity goes with it. Or they can camouflage and cover an infirmity so that the person who is suffering, and people suffer with sickness and disease, and yet the uh, doctors and scientists are completely unable to uh, distinguish and determine what's going on. And when that spirit is finally removed, all of a sudden there's no more camouflage. And all of a sudden they look and say, wow, look at this. There's a cancer here that has been here for probably two or three years and we've never seen it. Or there's a tumor here. or there's, And I've seen all these sorts of things transpire, folks. It is a very real thing. Now... Uh, The term that is uh, that is translated from the Greek for possessed is echo, literally. E-K-H-O is the phonetic spelling, but it's E-C-H-O is how it's spelled in the Greek. This word is translated devil because there is no word for possessed, but the word devil speaks of possession within its definition. The very definition of echo or devil is to have or to hold. To have or to hold. What many people do not realize is we often mischaracterize demon possession. When we look at demon possession, we look at it as though uh, the demon, in effect, owns the person. No, it does not. The demon occupies the person. It does not own the person. The person who actually is in a position of ownership as it relates to demon possession is the individual who is possessed. They possess the demon. They own the demon. They have literally taken ownership. That's why I say you go from oppression, which is external, to taking ownership of that spirit. Literally just taking it and welcoming it and inviting it into your life. I'm so full of bitterness. I'm so full of hatred. I'm so full of racism. I'm so full of anger. I'm so full of angst. I'm so full of judgment and criticism and condemnation. Any of these negative, ungodly attributes and emotions. I'm so full of these things that... Uh, a spirit has seen the opportunity to just step right in and literally just drive me off the edge of the bridge. Just push me to the limits in this particular area. Now, it's important to understand today, um, evil spirits cannot vex, oppress, or possess without probable cause. Much the same as 
uh, in the United States of America, you're not able to be, you're not supposed to be able to be searched by police officers uh, except they have probable cause, meaning they have to have some reasonable, visible evidence that you have committed a crime. And uh, there has to be something that suggests to them that you have committed a crime before they can legally, constitutionally search you, okay? Or search, for instance, your motor vehicle or what have you. Um, the same is true of a demon. A demon has to be able to see and observe evidence that you would welcome their engagement with your life. Okay, so I don't want people running out thinking, oh my goodness, every time I get angry, a demon, you know, is going to attach itself to me. No, no, no. But if you give yourself permission to walk in anger, to constantly be angry, then you're in danger. Okay, then you're walking on thin ice. Folks, one way that spirits gain access to people, and, and it's not fair, but it, it's how the enemy works. I told you, he works in the realms of emotion, he works in the realms of character, and he works in the realms of weakness. One of the ways that he, he can enter in is when we uh, are in a, an experience of pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, physical pain. And we do not respond to that pain in a biblical Christian manner. And we uh, get to the place where all we want to do is gripe and groan and complain about our pain. And all we want to do is just constantly wallow in our pain. That is a dangerous place to be. The pastor I served my internship in the Church of God, um, Brother Carver, Douglas Carver, marvelous man of God. I loved Brother Carver. He was a tremendous man of God. And he was telling me one time how that he had gone, a lady in his church had been involved in a car wreck, and she um, experienced some pretty serious injuries, and she wound up experiencing a lot of pain. And over the course of time, uh, it seemed like the pain was not subsiding, and she was just continually in a state of pain. And um, she allowed herself to become very angry and bitter. Here we go again. Those are your, those are your entry-level spirits, okay? Uh, over this pain. And it got to the point where the pain had become such a part of her life that at this point she was pretty much... Um, she was pretty much accepting of the notion that she was just always going to be in pain and that's all it was ever going to be. And if she was always going to be in pain, then she was always going to be angry. She was always going to be bitter. She was always going to be in a number of negative things. And Brother Carver had gone to their home to visit she and her husband. And he said that he was sitting in a chair across from her, and they were talking. And he said, all of a sudden, this spirit began to speak out through her mouth. And when a demon speaks, you will hear the demon's voice. When a person speaks in tongues, when somebody is uh, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, it is their spirit praying and because it is their spirit, it is part of them. So you will hear their voice. All right? When, and uh, this is one easy way to differentiate between something being satanic and something being God. Um, I've been in church services and had somebody go up 
in front of the church and all of a sudden, boy, a demon starts speaking through them. And you know when it's a demon because you're hearing the demon's voice. You're not hearing that individual's voice. You'll hear women speaking with men's voices, men speaking with women's voices. You'll hear a multitude of voices coming out of one mouth. Literally, it sounds like a crowd is speaking in unison, speaking out of one mouth. And um, he said all of a sudden this woman jumped up out of her chair and she lurched toward Brother Carver. And he said, I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name. And he said, when he said that, she had only gotten about halfway across the room. He said, I kid you not. He said, that woman went backwards up in the air and landed right back in her chair. He said, it was like an angel just pushed that woman right back into her chair. And then he proceeded to begin to cast demons out of this woman. And he said, um, I don't know exactly why he did this. Maybe he just didn't discern what the Spirit was. For me personally, the Lord usually shows me. I don't have to ask uh, what opened the door or how the demon gained access. Um, but he happened to ask the Spirit, you know, how did you gain access into this woman's life? What spirit are you? And this Spirit answered, Pain. And Brother Carver said, I kid you not, he said, when that demon said pain, he said the way it said it, the pitch of the voice, he said it literally made your ears hurt. He said it was like you thought your ears were going to start bleeding. He said it was a high-pitched, piercing, shrill of a voice that declared itself to be a spirit of pain, okay? So, this is part of the reason why, as believers, it is so important that we be diligent in trying to live our faith and not just uh, hypocritically read it and do different. You know, hear it preached and act differently. And this is another reason why the Word of God makes it very easy for believers to rectify an error. The Word of God said, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So anything negative that might even try to have attached itself to us in relationship to uh, our doing something we ought not to have done, saying something we ought not to have said, approaching things in a way we ought not to have approached it, if we will confess it to the Lord, God not only forgives, but He wipes the slate clean. And so this is why it's so important as believers. I tell people all the time, no Christian should ever have an aversion to saying two really important words. I'm sorry. If you've wronged somebody, if you've done somebody wrong, if you uh, mistreated or responded badly to your children, to your husband, your wife, your parents, your boss, whoever, a neighbor, we should not be adverse to simply going to them and saying, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have approached things that way. By doing that, what we're literally doing is we are going back and shutting any potential door we may have inadvertently opened, okay? Uh, any door we've left ajar. I have a young man who's interviewing me right now. We've had a couple of sessions, and we're going to be doing some more. They're doing a documentary on the paranormal, and he apparently found our paranormal website online and uh, wanted to interview me for this uh, documentary that they're doing. And um, I was explaining to him, you know, I said... Um, Demon spirits are opportunists, okay? 
they look for any opportunity they can to attach themselves. They look for any opportunity they can to vex. So if you get in the company of somebody who has an attachment, who is oppressed or possessed of a devil, they're going to reach out. They're going to take that opportunity to try to drag you in with this person into their troubles, into their frame of mind, into their sickness, into their um, way of approaching things and doing things. And, uh, and then, of course, an attachment or an oppression where they actually attach themselves to an individual. And uh, I said, and the sad part of it is that most often, um, people inadvertently, um, thank you, Miss Amy, uh, people inadvertently leave a door open. Just imagine, for instance, you know, I let my dogs out uh, the back door, and I open my back door, I let the dogs outside, I let the screen door close, and I leave my door ajar, and I walk away. Now, I've not invited anybody to come into my home, but at the same time, I may as well have. I've got a door that is visibly ajar, and I left the screen door unlocked. So in terms of diligent, I have not been diligent in protecting my home from an invader. No, at that point, if somebody who's bent on doing me harm, is watching me, looking at what I'm doing, then they're going to see, aha, probable cause. The door is unlocked. The second door is ajar. That gives me an opportunity. So that's all demons need in order to um, take a, an oppressive or a possession uh, position. Okay, that's all they need. And so many people, you have to understand, primarily this is going on in the world of unbelievers. This is going on in the world of non-Christians because they don't believe in any of this stuff anyway. They have no interest in living according to a biblical standard. They have no interest in trying to live a godly a Christian life based on biblical teaching, and therefore they are constantly, they're constantly uh, inadvertently opening doors and making it possible for spirits to attach themselves to them. And then, of course, many, uh, it grows and develops into a full-blown possession, okay? But a spirit must first have probable cause. Our enemy hunts like a carnivorous animal. He seeks to inspire fear, hoping we will respond in such a way as to be separated from the pack or injured in trying to run. First Peter 5, 8, 9, be sober, be vigilant. This is what I'm saying about uh, not leaving a door ajar, not leaving, you know, inadvertently uh, creating an invitation for the enemy. Be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. God's people ought always to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost so that no matter how loud or ferocious the enemy growls, we stand firm, knowing he has no power over us so long as we stand in faith and resist his threats. He seeks out the young, the sick, the injured, those who have been separated from the flock. I, I say this so often, and people, you know, if, if Satan has successfully run any campaign in the world in these last days, 
he has successfully convinced millions of professing Christians that they can be children of God, they can be Christians, and there is no need for them to be part of a church. I've had people say to me, well, you know, I'm a person of faith, I'm a Christian, I just don't believe in organized religion. Well, then you don't believe the Bible. The benefits of being part of a body, being part of the body of Christ, being part of a fellowship, having a family of faith, my friend, uh, the benefits of that go so far beyond just, uh, you know, going to church and having necks you can hug. No, the enemy, the first thing he does every single time is try to separate people and to draw them away, okay? Somebody else might see something that's going on. Somebody else might uh, see the enemy attacking you. They might see the enemy coming against you. They might see you're under siege by a spirit of depression or a spirit of despair or a spirit of hopelessness uh, or a spirit of unbelief. And they may respond to that in any number of ways. They may come to you and say, hey, let's go down to the altar and pray. They may say, hey, let's go get prayed for by the pastor or the evangelist. Uh, they may just say, hey, uh, I'm praying for you. I see the enemy's giving you a hard time, and I'm praying for you. But when you're not part of the body, you're not actively part of a fellowship, honey, you miss out on all those benefits. When I was a young man, uh, especially wrestling with my sexual orientation and, and my identification as a, a person, you know, dealing with this issue, I used to go through so much agonizing, just horrible depression. Uh, I... I used to experience depression that was mind-boggling. It was, it, it would, literal, excuse me, it was just um, crippling, to be honest. And uh, I'll never forget one Wednesday night in church. Uh, I was in church, and man, I'd been going through a battle, and the enemy was fighting me, and I was just under a, a constant barrage from a spirit of depression, and uh, most of the time when you're in the battle, you're not even recognizing it as a spirit. You're not recognizing that this spirit is vexing you, okay? It's not to the point of oppression. He may have gotten to the point of oppression, but a lot of times it's just that, that first vexation, okay? And... Uh, so I was really being vexed by a spirit of depression. And I mean, I was deep in a dark tunnel, but I went to church this night. And this is at the Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, Texas. And Sister Bruce, um, who was like an adopted mom to me, I, I loved her dearly. And Sister Bruce came over to me and we had a, the pastor's grandson was preaching that night. And uh, we were at the end of the message and people were going up for prayer and stuff. And I was just sitting in my pew and I'm just really deep in a dungeon. And Sister Bruce come over to me and she took me by the hand. She said, come on. She said, we're going to get you prayed for. And you don't tell Sister Bruce no. <laughs> she was a big lady. She was a brawny lady. You don't tell Sister Bruce no. She said, we're going up to get prayed for, honey. You're going up to get prayed for or your arm's coming out of its socket one, okay? So I got up and I began to walk toward the front of the church and carry, bless his heart, Brother Gillum's grandson. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He looked at me and immediately he discerned what was going on. 
And he said, you unclean spirit of depression, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And he reached forward to lay his hand on my head, but he got about this far away, maybe 10 or 12 inches, and the power of God hit me, honey. I mean to tell you, and I felt back on my back on that floor, felt like a cannonball had hit me. And I'm going to tell you something, I got up off that floor, and I wasn't depressed anymore. Oh, I want to tell you, God delivered me that night from that spirit of depression. Oh, it was a wonderful thing. I want to tell you, there are benefits. People don't understand why this pastor is so maniacal about people not coming out to church. You don't know what God could be doing in our church Sunday after Sunday. You don't know the spirits he could be delivering people from. You don't know the addictions and the strongholds of the enemy that he could be breaking. You don't know the healings that could be taking place. You don't know how the gifts of the Spirit could be operating. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discernment of spirits, tongues and interpretation, prophecy. You don't know. I do. I understand that this is why being part of the body is so integral because God has designed this incredible spiritual machine that is the church so that it, just like the human body, when part of the body is wounded, other parts of the body kind of come to the rescue. The immune system steps in and begins to... Uh, facilitate healing and health. That's what Sister Bruce did that night for me. She was a white blood cell, as it were, and she came. She could see I was wounded. I was hurting. I needed healing. I needed victory. I needed deliverance. Said, come on, we're going to go get prayed for. So this is why I'm not stupid enough, and I have to use the word stupid because, honey, if you think that being part of a church is unnecessary and, you know, you're all well and good being a Christian, but you don't need the church, then you're stupid. And, and I'm not going to mince words about it. You are a pure, D, full bred idiot. The Word of God specifically tells us not... To avoid the assembly of the believers. He said, especially as you see the day approaching. He said, the closer we get to the end time, honey, the more we're going to need the church. The more we're going to need corporate worship. The more we're going to need corporate prayer. Right now, I go to church on Sunday, and I'm almost done this week, but I go to church on Sunday sometime, and because we haven't been successful getting anybody to come to church, anybody to come out and be supportive of what we're trying to do, I'm going to tell you, I'm like fresh meat to the devil. The enemy jumps on me from every direction, every single Sunday. I sit in the, the chair up on the pulpit looking out over an empty building that we're spending thousands of dollars a month to provide. And the enemy just starts coming against my mind, just starts coming against my mind. Your ministry's worthless. You have nothing to offer. Look, nobody is interested in listening to you. Nobody gives a fig about what you have to say. Nobody sees anything in the way of potential in your church. Nobody sees 
any value in coming to your meetings. And, you know, this wasn't the case years ago when I was pestering in the mainstream. No, back then I was told I was going to be a camp meeting preacher. Back then I was called a maverick and my overseers thought I was wonderful because I could so easily and quickly pull together a church in a matter of months. We had 40 or 50 people every single Sunday and from conception. I was the only pastor in the church of God, my overseer told me, that he had ever seen start a church by simply renting a, a space and having meetings. He said, I've never seen this in the history of the church of God. He said, this isn't the way we start churches. He said, normally we... We have a preacher go into a community and he'll start doing uh, in-home Bible studies and inviting people and trying to get people to come to his home for Bible studies. And he may do that for three or four or five years. And once he gets people faithfully coming to his Bible study, and once they get up to maybe 10 or 12 people, he'll talk to them about how about if we could go ahead and organize us a church so we can have a full-blown church in this community. He said, I've never seen in my life where a preacher went into a town, found a meeting hall, started renting it, went around town telling people, I'm starting a church, here's a flyer, come be with us, here's my vision, here's what we're hoping to do, here's what I believe you're going to see, miracles, deliverance, healing, God's going to help people. We're going to do things like you've never seen it done before. And boy, howdy, Sunday one, we got 12 people. Sunday one, we got 15 people. My third church was probably the smallest start I ever had. And the first Sunday, I think we had maybe only, I think, six in my third church. And every one of those people stayed with us. And we just grew from there. So you think the enemy doesn't attack me? You think the enemy doesn't come against my mind? Yes, he does. I'd give anything to have people sitting in the pew who could look up at the pastor and say, Lord, I see the pastor's going through a struggle, Jesus. Lord, you need to bless him. Oh, God, move by your spirit today and touch him and help him bless him like he's never been blessed. You think I wouldn't appreciate having some people in the pew who could do that? I'd love to have that. You've got to be careful, folks. The first lie the enemy is easily able to convince people of is that you don't need the church. You don't need the fellowship of God's people. You can serve God and be a Christian, and you don't have to have that. That is a lie. That is deception. And that is the first instance for many believers of their being less than diligent and leaving that door ajar just enough for that low level, low authority, weak spirit to edge his way in. And then it's his job to keep pushing and keep pressing until that door opens a little wider a little wider, a little wider, so that the next level of authority, as I explained to this young man who's interviewing me for this documentary, as I explained to him, it's like uh, uh, any army. They're going to start with footmen. They're going to start with uh, privates. And the private gets in. Once the private's in, then he'll be followed by a corporal. Once the corporal's in, he'll be followed by a sergeant. Once the sergeant's in, he'll be followed by a general. But there isn't an army in the world that sends the general out in the first wave. Nope. Nope. The general calls the, calls the shots from back there. And then it's not until they've achieved a certain level of success, until they've gained enough of a stronghold before General um, 
the general's going to come popping in and make his appearance, okay? And that's how the spirit world operates. All right, so... As I've said, the, the enemy looks for the young, the sick, the injured, those who have been separated from the flock. Um, a hunting lion does not choose his victim at random. No, no lion, no lioness that's hunting chooses their victim at random. No, they're looking very specifically for the young. They're looking specifically for those who are sick or injured. They're looking specifically for one that has been separated from the rest of uh, the pack. But Luke chapter 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 9 and 1, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils, not most, not many, all devils, and to cure diseases. Mark 16, 15 through 18, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them, not may, not might, not should, not could, shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. First thing on the list. Said, in my name. First thing. They're going to cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing. He didn't say go out and grab snakes and drink poison. Said, but if it happens that you come upon these things. Said, you'll be able to deal with them. He said, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know what I do for a church full of people of faith who can lay hands on me and help me pray through to victory over some of the issues I've been wrestling with now for a number of years? I know if I had Riverside Church, I know for a fact I, I don't doubt it for one second that I'd be healed and delivered from some of this garbage that I wrestle with now for years, all because I don't have a church. You get a church full of people together, people who are hearing the preaching of faith, people who understand the word of God, and honey, I'm going to tell you, we'll run roughshod over the devil like you can't even believe. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. I wanted to end our session this week with some scriptures to empower you and to help you understand that as we study this subject matter, there is not a single session that you should ever walk away from without feeling victorious and empowered. Because, honey, the enemy's going to lose this battle and he can lose every war every battle if we walk in the power that God has made available to us through Jesus' name, in the authority of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Now I'm excited. Now I want to preach, but it's time to quit. Okay, next week we are going to begin to look at the various... Um, uh, Areas where the enemy takes advantage. We're going to be looking at 
Satan takes advantage of intended and unintended invitations, distress, ungodliness, spiritual uh, interaction, meaning you're interacting with someone that is not uh, <laughs> not full of the Holy Ghost, but is dealing with other spirits, false doctrine, proximity, and human emotion. We're going to be looking at each of these areas and how the enemy takes advantage of these areas. He sees that as an open door and an invitation, okay? So that's going to be our next session. I hope you'll come be with us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock for that. Until then, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master, once again, God, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the anointing of the Spirit. We thank you for the presence of God. Lord, it is a wonderful thing to know that as crafty and as deceitful and as opportunistic as our enemy is, our God has equipped his church to be far more powerful, far more authoritative, far more victorious than anything the enemy can bring against us. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that each and everything we have discussed this evening, I pray that it will resound and echo in our thinking, that, Lord, we will hear it over and over again until we become empowered by the Word of God to understand, Lord, that you have made a way for us to walk in victory, for us to walk in deliverance, for us to walk healed and whole. All you ask of us is that we be diligent in striving. We don't have to be perfect, but we must be diligent in striving to do our best so as not, Lord, to give any opportunity to the devil. Master, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for all of our online viewers and participants and extended members. They're such an important part of this ministry, and we're grateful for everyone. Go with us from this place, O oh God. Keep us, as I say, always under your mighty hand of protection. As the word of God promises, let the angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. We claim that promise, and we ask all this today and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. If you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, we need you. I'm, I, I get sick and tired of begging. I shouldn't have to beg anybody. If you can't feel the Holy Ghost in these uh, in our services and in our Bible studies, then, honey, there's something wrong with your Holy Ghost detector. And if you can't tell that we've got a vision and that God is trying to do something powerful, then the enemy must surely have deceived you because God is trying to do something powerful in these last days. Our nation's survival depends upon a church that isn't worshiping Donald Trump and isn't preaching mega and isn't fighting culture wars and isn't embroiled in politics, but a church that knows how to love like Jesus loves. And that includes everybody, straight, gay, or otherwise. We need a church in America to rise up and set an example for the church universal, of what God's church is supposed to look like and what God's church is supposed to act like. That's my vision. And if we don't get that, our nation is doomed because no matter who wins in November, the forces that are trying to destroy our democracy are going to keep doing it, honey. They're going to keep going. They're going to keep working on it. 
until they finally succeed. So if you think this election is going to end it and it's all going to be over, you are so wrong, it's not even funny. The only answer to the ills of this nation is a mighty move of God and a massive revival that gets the church back on track, reminds it of its spiritual mission, not its carnal worldly mission of politics and societal influence. That is not a battle we've been called to fight. So if you're in the Huntsville, Alabama area, come be with us at the Century Office Center, 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest, Suite number 537. And that is in Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. Sundays at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. You don't even have to get up early to go to church, for heaven's sakes. You can go to brunch. You can have a nice leisurely morning. Get whatever little errands you need done, done, and come to church at 3 o'clock. Shout a little. Get happy in the Holy Ghost. Go home empowered and ready to face another week. And then, of course... Uh, we hope you'll come be with us next Wednesday as well at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time as we continue our study, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. I hope you'll be with us next Wednesday. Till we see you next time. By the way, I am seeing your comments. Uh, Kit, I've been reading your comments. I appreciate those very much. Amy, you as well. Ellen Clark, I'm glad to see you. Uh, Anna Tarver, happy to see you today. Uh, just want you all to know that if you post a question or a um, comment, uh, I am seeing them, okay? And uh, I try to address, if I don't address it in the current uh, session, I will try to address things in, in future sessions that are brought up in the comments section. Till we see you again, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.